What I want to look at this morning is what the Bible says about death. What happens to you John. when you die and are the dead? John. Really dead. Is your mic on mute? Yes, my mic is on mute. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. There you go. How's that? That's better. Okay. Yeah, can you turn me down a little bit? I would. I have to whisper. Keep your Bibles open to John, chapter 11. What I want to look at first thing this morning is the story of Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He had two sisters. Do you know who they were? Mary and Martha. The Bible tells you that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Is that right? The story is kind of strange, though, because it says Jesus loved them. And when he was told that Lazarus was sick, he doesn't go there right away. He waits for days. But what you need to understand in this story is that there was a higher purpose for what Lazarus had suffered. And that God was going to be glorified in one of the greatest miracles that Jesus was going to do before the cross. Jesus had raised people from the dead prior to Lazarus. Right? But in each case, the unbelievers had an answer for this is my daughter. <laughs> oh, she really looks familiar. <laughs> Each case, when Jesus raised somebody from the dead, those who did not believe that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, had an answer for his miracle. They said that that person was asleep, they weren't really dead, but now in the story of Lazarus, there is no way to explain, except for the fact that this man was dead, and Jesus had the power to raise him from the dead. So let's look at this story in John chapter 11. Let's start with verse 11, as Carl, Carl read. He says that our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. So here you find Jesus using this term sleep for death. Now, if anyone was able to know what happens to you when you die, don't you think it would be Jesus? And that if you wanted a clear understanding of what happens to you when you die, I think you could trust his word, correct? So Lazarus is dead, but he tells his disciples that Lazarus is sleeping. Why do you think he used the term sleep? Any ideas? Wow, you guys got really quiet. Now listen, was Jesus the first person in the uh, Bible to use the word sleep for death? You can go throughout the Old Testament and you can find that word sleep. That this person slept with his fathers, slept with their fathers. Jesus uses it because he had a full and clear understanding of what it meant when we breathe our last. That is not final death. Right? And I'm going to show that to you here as we continue to study in this book of John. Now what we're going to do is we're going to read this story and I'm going to take you back to the scriptures. So keep your fingers here in John. Let's go on with our story. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. So when you look at this story, his disciples thought he was sick. Jesus said he's sleeping, and they're thinking, well, if he sleeps, then he'll probably get better. Jesus makes it plain what he meant. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking his rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, what? Lazarus is dead. Turn with me to Genesis, because if you want to know what happens to us, you'll find everything you need to know from the beginning 
in the book of Genesis. Now, the world, even those in the church, will tell you when you die, you continue to live on. But in the book of Genesis, it makes a claim what happens to us. So turn with me to Genesis, I believe it's going to be Genesis chapter 3. You're familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, correct? We've gone over that many times. Genesis. I bring you to chapter 3 because here we have the interplay between Eve, the serpent, Adam. They disobey God. They're told that if they disobey God, something is going to happen to them, correct? But before I get into that, let me ask you a question. When God created Adam, how did he do it? It says that he took the dust of the ground and with his own hands he formed a body. Right? And in forming this body, this was the body of Adam. When he formed that body, it was complete. Was it a lot yet? No. How did this body of dust become a lot? The Bible says that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. In the King James it says a living soul. It doesn't say that God breathed into him and he had a soul. It says he became a living soul, or a living being in other translations, right? So life took the forming of the body, but it still wasn't alive. What brought life to that body was the breath of God, right? He breathed into him and man became alive. So life comes from God because God is life. So listen, God tells Adam and Eve, you can eat of every tree that's in the garden except for the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And that's the tree of the knowledge of what? The day you eat of it, you shall what? You will die. Okay? Was God just trying to scare them? No. God was speaking to them truth. The day you eat of this, you will die. Why? Because you will have disobeyed me. And you will no longer be in harmony with me. Because God is life. So, in chapter 3, we find this conversation between Eve and the serpent. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you what? Because if you do, what's going to happen to you? You would not. What do you think she thought of death? Did she ever see death before this time? Did she have an idea by looking at death what it would be? She had an idea that God said, You will die, and death meant a cessation of life. She was alive then, right? Death would be something opposite of what she was. So if God said you will die, do you think she believed him? Hmm? Think about that. Do you think what God said to them? Do you think she believed what God said? I think she did. When she talks to God after she sins, what does she say? The serpent beguiled me. What does that word beguile mean? Tricked. So here is the beginning of the deception that is still in our day about what happens to you when you die. When you die, every religion on the earth has an answer to what happens when you die. Most of them believe that you don't really die. That you continue to live on 
in a different state or a different form. Some teach that you die, you come back as something else, you die again, come back as something else, die again. It's called reincarnation. But what does the Bible actually say? God in Genesis, from the beginning, said that if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. So when they ate, they became sinners, right? And all their offspring after them will be born sinners. The soul that sinneth, the Bible says, shall wash. So let's look at this a little closer. Verse 4, Then the servant said to the woman, What? You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So again, I bring this to you because I want you to see how the world has twisted and has been deceived in what happens to you when you die. Was God clear in what he said? That if you sin, you will die. Cessation of life, die. Now, the devil said, you will not surely die. In the churches today, who do they believe? God or the devil? Because if you're continuing to teach that when you die, you continue to live, who are you following the example and the teaching of? What God said or what the devil said? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is very important because when you talk about two people and you want to talk to them about what happens to you when you die, this is where you need to bring them back to. Right to Genesis, right to the beginning. Because in the end, they have to make the decision. Do you believe what God said or do you believe what the devil said? God says you will die. The devil says, you will not surely die, but you will live on in a higher state and be like God. That's what deceived her. What was it about God that she wanted to make her eat that fruit? She wanted to be like God. The Bible says, who has immortality? Do we have it? No. The Bible says that only God has immortality. Right? Say it a lot, Ricky. First Timothy 6 16. And we'll be getting that in a, to that in a little bit. Only God has immortality. Yes, sir. Did you know the difference between good and evil? He asked the question Did she know the difference between good and evil? She was created perfect, right? She knew good. Did she really need to know evil? Was evil ever part of God's plan? Evil only brings death. She had all the information she needed. What she needed to do was trust God and trust His Word. Right, Ricky? Yeah, uh, she didn't understand the absence of God. And how could she? Did she need to have that information to make the proper choice? And the answer is no. God gave her everything she needed. What she needed to do was trust His Word. And God's Word said, the day you eat it, you will die. Why? Because the fruit was poisoned? Or because you become a sinner? You understand that? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Because it is in disobedience to God. And God has created us to obey Him. Right? Because that is what truth, that is what real love, and that is what real harmony is, is obeying God. So listen. You know the rest of the story. The serpent lied to her. Is that right? Or did he tell her the truth? He lied to her. And so she became a sinner. She gave the fruit to her husband. He became a sinner. And now all their offspring, which is me and you, are born sinners. Now, in the course of time, will we die? This is what happened to Lazarus. So turn back to John. This 
death that Lazarus died here. As the Bible talks about how many deaths. Only one? Two. Two. Right? The real death, the final death, is the second death. That is eternal separation from God. Is that right? That is what Eve and Adam deserved the day they disobeyed God. Why didn't that happen? Because Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And his sacrifice, though it was in the future, the blood of the lamb would cover them. I want you to think about this. God gave them freedom of choice. They had the opportunity to obey or disobey, but if they disobeyed, God in His love still had a plan. It did not take Him by surprise. Nor did He cast them off, but His blood covered them because of His great love. Now, realize that God's love for you is the same way. It is an eternal love, and it's hard to even put in words. Going back to our story in John with Lazarus, He tells the disciples that He's dead, and then, he doesn't go right away because Jesus understood that there was a bigger purpose for what Lazarus would experience and the loss that his sisters were experiencing now. And you need to understand that when you, under, or you start to think about God's will for your life. Why do bad things happen? Why do you experience pain? Why do you experience suffering? Do you believe that God is love? Do you submit yourself to whatever His will is? Because that's the hard thing. Lazarus submitted to God's will. Jesus didn't come and save him. He fell asleep. But was that the end of his story? No. Why? Because God knew. God knew Lazarus. And God knew that there was a bigger plan being worked out here. So turn back to chapter 11. It says, verse 17, So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead in the tomb for how many days? Can you imagine a body four days in the heat of the Middle East? What would happen in four days? You think it would start to decay? Okay. Was there any question that Lazarus was dead? No. <laughs> there would be no if, ands, or buts. This man was dead. And he was in the grave. He, he was dead. So when Jesus raised him back to life, they were able to see that he had the power of life itself. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will not die. Right? So as we continue our story, verse 18, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the woman around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, what? Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again. When? Now let me ask you a question. Because of the state of the dead. If you died and went straight to heaven, don't you think Jesus would have said that there? Yes. When did he say that her brother would rise again. And when did she know that the brother would rise again? On the resurrection day. When is that day? The second coming, right? When you see this story, you have to ask yourself questions when it comes to what happens to you when you die. Jesus is the one who would know. Jesus did not say, he's up there, I'll call him back down here. She even knew that he would live again on that resurrection day. 
And that was something in the future. Is that correct? <laughs> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary. Now, isn't it funny that Mary comes to him and says the same thing? Lord, if you'd only been here sooner, my brother would not have died. Do we not say the same thing to God when he doesn't answer our prayers according to our time? Aren't there things that we go through and we wonder where God is at? If only he showed up. But listen, God never leaves you and he never forsakes you. Just like with Martha and Mary. God has his plan and he has his timetable and we work according to that. Not the opposite. This is why submission sometimes is so hard. So we go on to our story and what does Jesus do? Let's skip down to let's go to verse 32. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, what did Jesus do? Yeah. Wow. Shortest verse in the Bible. Why did Jesus weep? Was he just caught up in the emotion of everything? No. no. Was Jesus human? Yes. Did he have all the emotions that you and I have? Yes. Was Lazarus his friend? Yes. But there was something more here today. Can you imagine being the God of life and the only one that really knows what death is, is God? And being able to look the past, the present, the future, all as one. We know what suffering is, right? What we know of suffering is nothing compared to what God knows of suffering. Because God knows the suffering of every person who has ever lived on this planet. And he sees it. He felt it. Jesus sees the grave of his friend Lazarus. And he weeps. Why do you think he weeps? What emotions were going on in his mind? Do you think at that point he knew that there would come a day when he would finally defeat death and hell? Let's look at our story. Verse 36, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Where were these guys at his trial? They had that kind of faith in him that, Man, he opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he keep him from dying? Where were they at his trial? When he was accused of being the king of the Jews, the son of God. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, what? Lazarus. Why do you think he called Lazarus by name? <laughs> now listen, listen. What did he say? Lazarus what? Did he say Lazarus come down? 
Did he say, Lazarus, come out? No. What did he say? No. Lazarus, because where was Lazarus at? In the tomb. In the tomb. Right. right? So <laughs> what happens to you? What happened to Lazarus for those four days that he was dead? Where was he at? He was, the body was in that tomb. Yes. The Bible says that he was sleeping. He had no knowledge of what was going on. He wasn't in heaven, he wasn't in hell, he wasn't somewhere in between, purgatory. <laughs> that when you die, it's just like when you sleep at night. You've ever come home from work from a really hard day, and the moment your head hits that pillow, you're out. Do you have any idea what your dog is doing while you're sleeping? Right? <laughs> until, until you wake up the next morning and see. Do you have any idea if somebody's called you because you didn't hear the phone? You have no idea what's going on. All you're doing is sleep, right? So when you die, it's the same thing. Your thoughts cease. Whatever activity you had going on and plans, they come to an end. But you rest in Christ. Now, people say that you have a soul, and it goes back to God. What does the Bible say? That... When God created Adam, he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became what? A living soul. At death, what goes back to God? The breath. Right? The breath of God. Yes, John. Hey, uh, he says Jesus around the body. Mm -hmm. wept. Is it possible he was weeping because most of them didn't understand? Other than... Do you hear his question? It says that... The scripture we just read, Jesus groaned twice. It also says Jesus wept. He was overcome with emotion. I want you to think, why? What was causing him to be so emotional? Why was he groaning in his spirit? A couple of things was the unbelief of the people. Right at this point, you can see the cause of sin, what it leads to. Also, the love that he had for Lazarus. We go through our lives and we can get so caught up in the day today with what we have to do, the responsibilities of our family. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to walk this earth when he came to the full understanding that he was the Son of God? That all the creation that he saw came from his hands. That he was with the Father. The Father and him were one. And he came from a place that was pure joy, pure light, pure holiness. And he came to this earth. And he didn't just come for a day. But he lived a life. And he understood what it meant for us to walk in this kind of darkness. Jesus said that he was the light of the world. He also says that you're the light of the world. But can you imagine what it would be like for him, day in and day out, to deal with that kind of pressure, knowing where you came from and where you're at now, and seeing the results of disobedience to God. But here's the biggest thing. The Bible tells you the story of a leper coming to Jesus. And the leper came to him. And do you know what lepers had to say when he got near people? Why? Because the disease they had was very contagious, right? And so people would step back and stay away from them. Alright? So when you were a leper, you were no longer part of society. And if people saw you, they got out of your way. And you had to tell them. So they would get out of your way. But do you understand that when he came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can heal me. What did Jesus do? What did he do? He touched him. Can you imagine that? He touched him. That's not just written in there to blow past. You need to understand the significance of that. This is the love of a Savior who was giving his life for the world. That when the leper came to him and realized his only hope is in Christ... Christ touched him. The touch of the Savior. Probably the first touch he had 
in a long time. But then Jesus touched him and spoke to him. And what did Jesus say? I am willing. Be